Forward's Outkick 360's host, Chad Withrow, joining us here to talk about all the big storylines in the league this weekend. What's going on, man? How you been? Doing well. It's been a fun fall so far. A lot of, uh, a lot of ups and downs. I know especially in, in your neck of the woods. But uh, it's, it's definitely been eventful so far in the SEC this season. So I'm having a great time. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, thank you, man. So I, I want to talk AM with you in a moment, but let's, let's start off with the, the big marquee matchup. Uh, you've got Alabama and Tennessee. I don't know if anybody's playing better than Hennon Hooker right now. Bryce Young probably going to play in this one. Alabama looks vulnerable. Tennessee keeps answering questions. What's your gut in this one? My gut is that Alabama is still a lot more talented than Tennessee, and they probably win a game something like 38 to 30. Uh, I think it's going to be somewhat close, but I think Alabama is still the more talented team. But this is the first time in a long time that you go into this Tennessee-Alabama game believing that Tennessee's got a puncher's chance to, to win the game, uh, especially at Neyland Stadium. College game day will be there for the second time in three weeks after being there for the Florida game. So there's a lot of positive momentum for Josh Heupel in this program. You mentioned Hendon Hooker. Uh, I think he's right there for the Heisman Trophy right now, almost halfway through the season. I think it would be a huge upset if he's not in New York City as a finalist by season's end. This Tennessee offense is cooking. Um, Josh Heupel knows how to coach offense. He's done a great job with the touch of this team and making sure that he's hitting all the right notes. Um, but I look at Alabama, and I believe Bryce Young is going to play in this game and my initial thought is that's just going to be a little bit too much for Tennessee. Now, if it's Jalen Milrow again, I, I would give Tennessee a much better chance at, at pulling off the win at home. Uh, but there was a reason that I think it opened as an eight and a half point line in favor of Alabama, and it's since gone down to seven and a half. But uh, either way, it's going to be a great game on Saturday and certainly a great atmosphere at Neyland Stadium. Chad, is it fair to say that while I think Georgia and Alabama and even Ohio State are the top dogs out there, but in the SEC, both divisions – are potentially there for the taking uh, if it's Ole Miss, if it's Mississippi State in the West, if it's Tennessee there in the East. I feel like it's there. It's available. Yeah, I mean, I think there's still – a. Uh, I think the drop-off has shrunk. And what I mean by that is there's Alabama and there's Georgia, and then there is a drop-off, and then there's the other teams that are in, in contention. You know, in the East, it would be Tennessee at this point. In the West, you nailed it, Ole Miss, Mississippi State. But I don't think the drop-off is as sizable as it was a year ago, especially in the case of Georgia, who, while they, they're undefeated and they're still a great team, they've shown some cracks this year. Bama, really, for a second straight year, we saw it a year ago. I was, I was there in College Station when, and when A&M upset them. But there were other games where the game was closer than it should be. I remember a game in, in Gainesville against Florida uh, where Alabama has just uncharacteristically made mistakes the past couple of seasons whether it be penalties or turnovers, that we haven't seen a lot from a Nick Saban team. So I believe that Alabama, because of their mistakes, is a little bit more mortal than they've been in recent years. And Georgia, I don't know if it just wasn't showing up or legitimate cracks on, on defense, but they showed against Sean Lewis's Kent State team that an offense like what Josh Heupel runs, they could be susceptible against in, in giving up a lot of yardage in that game and then really just no-showed against Missouri and had to come back and hold on for the win. Um, so I, I still think it's Georgia, Alabama, and then everyone else. But I think that that separation from the then everyone else has shrunk a bit this season. Chad, from an A&M perspective, I feel two things can be true. A uh, huge disappointment. They, they, this is a, a, t a program in year five under Jimbo that should not be three and three. Yet super excited about what these young guys are doing right now and maybe – turning the corner here for this season not saying that they're going to be, win every game but that's certainly possible with this roster and what's ahead yeah I look at A&M and obviously there's talent there and there's a lot of young talent with that recruiting class that came in and they're a good team defensively and that's where their athleticism and talent really shows right now is on defense I think they're honestly Jimbo Fisher firing himself as offensive coordinator away from being right there in the SEC West uh, with a chance at surpassing Alabama I mean that's the one thing I see that is missing is if Jimbo Fisher decides to sort of humble himself a bit and say, this isn't working offensively, I need to go in a different direction, and goes in and hires um, a Kendall Bryles, for example, just the name I'm, I'm throwing out there, that's a bit more of an innovator as an offensive mind, then I, I think that A&M is going to take a big leap up because it's the offense that's the problem so far. So I can understand the excitement from Aggie fans about the future with the young talent. 
But now the challenge is, and we're going to see this across the country with every program, when you struggle and if you struggle, making sure that guys stay involved, stay interested, and you don't want people jumping shit because they had one tough season, which unfortunately I think we're going to see a, a lot more of with an open transfer portal. Uh, that would be what I would guard against if I'm A&M. But if they keep the young talent on the roster and they make a move to a different offense and a different offensive coordinator, there's there's no reason that A&M can't be where we thought they might be this season, next season. Absolutely. Talking to Chad Withrow here on uh, up to the second college football. Ole Miss, I'm, I'm really fascinated by them because I'm not really sure who they've beaten. I know they beat Kentucky, but uh, but yet – They've kind of redefined their offense. They're running the ball so effectively. Like, how legit is Ole Miss this year? It's crazy with Lane Kiffin because I keep thinking to myself, how much does he have to win at Ole Miss before I feel like he's happy to be at Ole Miss? Because there's this weird thing where he just makes, and it's kind of his personality, I know, but he's he's commenting on you know students leaving early and not having an atmosphere in the second half, and he publicly flirts with every job that comes open. Um, and I'm thinking to myself, what is so wrong with you at Ole Miss? I mean, you went to the Sugar Bowl a year ago. They're on a path to go to another New Year's Six Bowl game, possibly this season. And I know that their schedule is going to get a lot tougher. But here they are undefeated. Um, they should remain undefeated after this upcoming week. I mean, it's just he's built a really good program at Ole Miss. And you're right. They've done it a number of different ways. Matt Corral and that offense is completely different what we're seeing with Jackson Dart and Zach Evans and this rushing attack now for Old Miss. For Old Miss, so I look at the program being led by Lane Kiffin, and I think, why is he not completely happy right now at Old Miss? And then I, I see what they've done so far this season, and think they're every bit as dangerous as every other team we've talked about in the conference. So KJ Jefferson should be back for Arkansas. At least that's the feeling out there in Fayetteville. But this is a team that could easily, and I hate saying it that you know so blunt, but they could easily lose four straight because BYU's that's. It's a weird timing for a game, too. Yeah, I saw that there. Uh, I feel like that game opened as maybe BYU as a slight favorite, and now I think it's Arkansas minus two last time I checked. Very strange game. When I saw this, when you're going through the preseason schedule and I see a mid-October trip to Provo, Utah for Arkansas, very strange timing. Uh, BYU's coming off a tough loss on the national stage in Vegas against Notre Dame. So I, I think – I think Arkansas is in a tough spot here. Uh, I think they are going to win, lose their fourth straight. Excuse me, lose their fourth straight this this weekend against BYU, and they've really been the media darling since Sam Pittman got there. And I get it with what he's done with that program, and seemingly he's done everything in his image, which is also Arkansas Razorbacks' image, and it fits culturally to perfection to what Arkansas wants, but they're lining themselves up right now for what's going to be a disappointing season. Uh, it's another one of those programs like A&M that the hope is that you just don't lose perspective or lose touch with what's made you successful. And I think that's top down. That's coaches convincing themselves of that and coaching convincing coaches, convincing the players of that as well, because, you know, situations like we saw at SMU that's happening mid season. I fear more of that in the future. And I think this may be what we're going to have more once we get to the offseason with some players who just aren't happy to be mediocre uh, record-wise at the school they're at, and they're going to try to find greener pastures. And as we know, it's not always greener on the other side. Yeah, that's certainly the case. Here, last thing for you. In the short term, who do you think is set up for more success, Florida or LSU? Uh, long term, I think that's a, a longer discussion, but at least for what you see the rest of 2022. I think probably Florida, um, and I say that because if I had to pick a quarterback that can truly change a game, it's Anthony Richardson. Now, the downside of that is Anthony Richardson can also change a game the other way. Uh, he's got the capabilities of, of doing that. But with what we saw in the game for him against Utah, what we saw against Tennessee, that was his best performance as a quarterback, even in a loss. He was terrific in that game throwing the football. We haven't seen that level of accuracy from him with any consistency. But I'm looking at the – I think a lot of things are equal with those two programs right now and where they are. They've got some good talent, but they have no depth. Uh, they've got some top-end talent, and that's it. There's a bit of a disconnect with new coach and the roster that they inherited. Uh, there were some quick fixes that were tried to be made at both programs to bring in transfers. There's a lot of similarities there. So I'm going to give the tiebreaker to Anthony Richardson over Jaden Daniels. 
in that situation because I think he's more of, a, of an impact guy at quarterback. So I, I'll take Florida over LSU, but s- just slightly. Chad, great stuff, man.